Welcome and thank you for being here to share our stories. I'm excited to show you some of my discoveries since reading West with the Night with Michael Proof. Who knew that my parents, Mac and Irene, were on the edge of aviation history? Please take a journal and jot down your family stories. I'll take a few questions and then we'd like to hear your stories uh, or what you'd like to uh, share with us um, at this intersection with a Chicago aviation history. First, I'd like to introduce Michael Hawk, who wrote Aviation Chicago Timeline with any date you need to know. Uh, you can see I've got it marked pretty heavily <laughs> for a lot of uh, my research. And Carol Orange, A Discerning Eye, uh, for how to find um, the Gardner Museum heist through art as the clues. So that's a little bit of the two thought processes that I use um, in discovering the story that I was never told. I'm here to fly one of those, Max exclaimed as his friend Jack at their 17th birthday fet at the ice, Esquire ice cream shop in Oak Park. He was pointing to the propeller plane that roared above the auto waves. Mac had been up late the night before drawing cartoons for the 1939 Fenwick yearbook. He imagined a comic strip of a low-flying propeller plane like Kitty Hawk, made of wood and wire. It took its first flight in 1903. Eleven years later, sophisticated World War I bombers were individually made the same way. What humans can do. Oh, I still want to fly one of those, she whispered surprisingly loudly to her friend. They stood in line behind the tall Fenwick boys, who gazed from beneath their eyebrows to see who spoke so ardently. She ordered her regular hot fudge sundae with peanuts. Then she ordered her friend's Green River float with orange sherbet. The gray and pink pastel booths were filled mostly with Trinity and Fenwick students. Irene and Charlotte had just gotten off the Madison Avenue bus from their first semester at Francis Parker's Teachers College near the airport. Matt paused to nibble slowly on his macaroon cookie before sitting with Jack and his friends in a booth. It's your birthday, go ahead. Did I hear you want to fly airplanes? He brazenly asked Irene. Charlotte introduced herself and settled into the booth. In 1919, the year Max's parents were married, military pilots John Elcott and Arthur Whitten Brown flew a Vickers Vivi twin-engine plane converted to an NC-4 seaplane. His mother told him that it took 72 hours to fly from the U.S. to crash in Derry Gimla Bog in Clifton, Ireland. Winston Churchill presented them with the prize money. King George V knighted them during Irene's five-year-old birthday week, May 20 to 21, in 1927, 25-year-old Charles Lindbergh went from obscurity as a U.S. airmail pilot to instantaneous world fame. He received the Orte Prize for making the first solo non-stop flight from New York City to Paris. Lindbergh covered the 33 and a half hour, 3,600 mile flight alone in a single-engine Ryan monoplane, the spirit of St. Louis. Irene's 10th birthday week, Amelia Earhart was the first woman to solo pilot a transatlantic nonstop flight. She received the U.S. Distinguished Flying Cross. Mac listened to her story, uh, imagined his uh, cartoon strip adding two frames to his cartoon of a 1929 stock market crash and the 1930s Great Depression that delayed, delayed airplane development. Even with the delay, in 1932, the Chicago Municipal Airport was the busiest in the nation with 100,847 passengers and 60,947 flights landing to refuel and exchange mail. Traveling is my dream, he saw by her saying it that it made it more real. He told her he loved to ride in the front window of the elevated train that felt like flies. Mac learned that Irene had witnessed early stunt pilots when she lived in New Mexico. He imagined spiraling planes over a saguaro cactus depicted in Russian ink for his 
next cartoon frame. We love going to the Albuquerque racetrack for the baseball games played in the center ring. The incomprehensible flying Curtis model plane did stunts over the infield in the seventh inning, I mean said. Mac was ignited. When her gray blue eyes lit up, she could be talking about anything now, and he would gaze into those eyes without a thought in the world that she was talking about flying sent him to the moon. Lincoln Beachley would fly races with Eddie Rickenbacker behind the automobile driver's wheel. Irene said, I so wanted the plane to win. My brother Harry cheered for the automobile. July 28, 1935, a four-engine plane took off from Boeing Field in South Seattle on its first flight. Rolling out of its hangar, it was simply known as the Boeing 299. Seattle Times reporter Richard Smith dubbed the new plane with its many machine gun mounts, the Flying Fortress. The Army had requested a large, multi-engine bomber. The prototype, financed entirely by Boeing, went from design to flight in less than 12 months. By Tammy Davis Biddle's account, in less than 12 months of relentless, sleepless nights nationwide, with increased strain that required ingenuity of allocation and coordination, of false starts, struggles, redesign, failures, tweaking, and retraining for every bolt, axle, blade, lug nut, and rivet the plane of a plane that had never been seen before. Shortages of rubber for tires, aluminum, steel, and labor were overcome. Shipping by newly built trucks competed with material needed for planes. Mac and Irene were 15 years old when they each followed Borough Markham's 20 hour flight from England on September 4, 1936, across the Atlantic in the Messenger. Borough Markham survived the Vega Gills crash landing in Baleen Cove on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. She missed her arranged fanfare in New York City. Burl wrote her own memoir. Mac's final cartoon strip frame showed a flowing haired woman waving as she crossed the Atlantic in an open cockpit plane. Best birthday ever. Chicago aviation history gets really exciting in 1937 when the Chicago Municipal Airport expanded with crisscrossing runways intersecting at a central locomotive track. This shows the locomotive in the middle. Um, there's the train, and it comes this way and that way, and the planes take off that way and that way, missing the train, hopefully. That's, it's now Midway Airport. Yeah, that's uh, Chicago Municipal Airport. And Irene at the time was, uh, I'll tell you in order. Um, so in, also in 1937, uh, two individually constructed Boeing planes were ordered. Mac and Irene had met. Irene had started her teacher's art portfolio when the Stradaliner adaptation of the Flying Fortress took its maiden flight. After the 1938 Munich Agreement failed, France and England ordered and financed the first mass production of Boeing planes. The Stradaliner crashed in 1939. Mac and Irene met again at St. Catherine Siena Dance on Sunday night in 1938. Twisted cray paper streamers and balloons were taped from the basketball net to the green tile walls. A teen chatted with two friends, a boy and a girl. Another girl walked in their direction. Hair was held in a flip with hairspray, slicked back or tied tight in a ponytail. I'd rather be a lieutenant than a jailbird, Glenn said. Have you ever seen so many navy polka dotted scarves, Irene said? I'd love the shoes, so many heels to choose from, Madeline said. Why would you enlist, Len? Charlotte asked. It's not America's problem. What's bigger than a world war? Len wriggled. Lo and behold, 
If it isn't a long drink of water, Irene smiled at Mac, who she had recently met. A magazine was rolled in his trouser pocket. Hi, Mac, Madeline and Charlotte said at the same time. Hey, Mac, what's bigger than a world war and smaller than a thumb, Len asked. The bullet you dodge, Mac said, a bit peeved to be talking about Europe's war. That's it, Mac, better than the one ahead. I was going to say the bullet that got you. Mac opened the Collier's magazine and showed Irene his published cartoon. They all leaned in with pride from a friend, jealousy from another, a glow from Irene and dismay from another. Emotions muddled in their huddle. Just then, Billie Holiday's rendition of Summertime from Porgy and Bess began. Irene, would you like to dance? Matt took her gloved hand in his, and they disappeared onto the dance floor. Her hand lightly, gracefully welcomed his. His hand gently, sh sh shyly supported hers. Their two sets of blue eyes met. They turned and dipped to their living that was easy, becoming increasingly oblivious to their summertime surroundings. Mac twirled Irene, who lightly spun on her right toe. The world was just the two of them. She was caught by her waist in his arm, his right drawing arm. Their graduation from high school melted away. The giddy expectations of what they'd do next evaporated into a misty future. This moment was their entire life. Each had reached the sheer precipice of childhood's plateau at the same time. Hand in hand, they left into embracing caresses and gentle kisses. The music faded to the announcer who called the last dance. And it will be a slow one. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. Louis Armstrong's rendition played the last tune of the Siena dance as they walked arm in arm to the Washington Street Trail. Good night, Irene, good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dreams. As the song faded, with distance and amplified in his mind, Mac escorted Irene to Central Park Boulevard in Austin, cognizant to walk on the street side in case a car splashed puddles. Just then, a propeller plane flew over. Santa Fe, Irene pointed up, guessing at its destination. Santa Monica Beach. Matt guessed and laughed. So began their mutual love and game of guessing planes destinations. In 1940, Mac was drawing cartoons for Extension Magazine. Uh, Irene was distracted by more planes flying over Teachers College while earning her certification to teach art when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt ordered 50,000 B-17s from Stratoline aircraft, then 50,000 more. Mac's cartoon showed more speed lines as a limited number of bombers reached speeds of 165 miles an hour. The first B-17 saw combat in 1941 when the British Royal Air Force took a delivery of several flying fortresses for high altitude missions. As World War II intensified, the bombers needed additional armament and armor. The B-17E, the first mass-produced model of the flying fortress, carried nine machine guns and 4,000 pound bomb load. It was several tons heavier than the prototypes and bristled with armament. He drew the first Boeing planes with a distinctive and enormous tail for improved control and stability during high altitude bombing. He sketched each version with more machine guns, content to show readers artillery through cartoons. This was his act of service. The revolutionary B-52 giant bombers was made with a range of 5,000 miles, armor, armaments, and self-sealing gas tank. For scale, he drew the plane to extend beyond the frame. Chicago papers were buzzing in 1941, when aeronautic history took a giant blind leap as the newly named Chicago Midway Airport became the nation's refuel hub. Every Midwest firm had an immediate need for finite sources of aluminum, steel, copper, and glass. With standardized mass production, bent plexiglass allowed peripheral vision for pilots and navigators to say, 12 o'clock high. Manufactured planes were delayed as they waited on guns, radios, and propellers. Making trucks to transport fuel exasperated material shortages. 
Ford Automobile Plant created a mile-long assembly line that made 300,000 aircraft between 1940 and 1942. January of 1942, armed Illinois Reserve Militia guarded Midway Airport. January of 1942, Boeing converted its Model 307 to military service for overseas flights. Irene graduated from Teachers College during the Rosie the Riveter era of women replacing enlisted men in the workforce. Congress cut the education budget for the war. Irene joined teachers to fly with United Airlines in the Strata Line that cruised at 20,000 feet and held 33 passengers. These flights transported supplies while stewardesses nursed military in unpressurized cabins. The pressurization of equipment was removed to allow for less fuel stops. Every flight was a reminder of Irene's first time flying in a Boeing Stradlin. She told Mac over an ice cream sundae. It was exhilarating to climb the metal steps of the airplane at midway. I tiptoed to keep my heels from poking through the openings of the graded steps. The four propellers sputtered, coughed like a waking uncle, then caught as each propeller whirred into invisibility. The wooden chocks were tugged from under the wheels. Peeking out the tiny window, the ground crew waved. I fastened my seatbelt twice as the plane was pulled forward by the propellers onto the runway that intersected at its midpoint with another airstrip. We waited for a train to pass at the halfway point of the runway. Speed built as the plane met the wind and used it to lift. Back imagined her taking off while strapped in. I'm going to fly a Boeing. I need to fly. In 1942, Mac, a cartoonist for a Chicago magazine, became a war correspondent cartoonist with the U.S. Navy. Mac spiraled into his hero's journey with a kiss charm photo of Irene in his pocket, his mother's encouragement, and a rare paternal handshake. On January 1 of 1943, he flew solo for the first time at Glenview Naval Air Base. It was a rocky landing. Boeing Plant 2 built a total of 6,981 various models of B-17s. Another 5,745 variations were built under a nationwide collaborative effort by Douglas and Lockheed, or the Vega. Only a few B-17s survive today, featured at museums and air shows, mostly they were scrapped at the end of the war. By 1945, overseas passenger flights were commonplace. In the Pacific, the B-17 earned a deadly reputation with the Japanese, who dubbed them four-engine fighters. The Flying Fortresses were legendary for their ability to stay in the air after taking brutal poundings. Seventy-five years after the B-17's first flight, an 88-year-old veteran sent the Boeing Company a letter. After explaining how he returned to England after a bombing raid over Germany with 179 flak holes and only two out of the four engines, he wrote, I'm glad to be alive. Thank you for making such a good airplane. General Carl Spatz, the American air commandeer in Europe, said, Without the B-17, we may have lost the war. In 2021, we find ourselves in a similar place. Every person in the world has been affected by unprecedented loss of loved ones and cloistered. Not understanding material and labor shortages, we reinvent traditional recipes, grow our own, and make it ourselves. At the same time, deliveries are made in a day as we watch the robotic 2021 Ingenuity flight on Mars. Mac and Irene would have followed every Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram post. Congress just passed a nearly $2 trillion bill for infrastructure change to remake how we source energy and store it. Harnessing solar, wind, and water energy helps the U.S. to reach the collaborative Paris Agreement 2050 carbon neutral goal. The new world domination battle is for lithium battery material. We have entered another can-do era where change is planned, voted for, and possible. All it takes is our ingenuity, our will to change, and our nation to overcome differences and work together. If Trees Could Talk tells more of Mac's experience during World War II.